And if your chicks hatch later in the spring and then it gets toward fall, the timing and the day length might not be right. So they might not start in the fall, the mother might start in the spring. How about a meat bird? How long do you get it up to butchering weight? Yes, this is what Six weeks? Yeah. I, I usually say eight weeks. I mean, a lot of people promise six weeks, but that would be in a more factory situation where they're really pumping the feed. In your backyard, it's likely to take at a minimum of eight weeks, and that's for the heavy breed, the Cornish Rock Cross. My roosters are ready usually in about three months, and mine run around the yard and all over eating bugs and grass and everything else. They're not fed particularly heavy with grains. So that's sort of more of a natural maturity, I think, for a chicken is three to four months. And mine will be tough, so they tend to not be boilers but go to soup top, no matter who they are. And how long do they live? I think we get two to three years of productive egg laying out of the chickens, but some people in the room who will not remain nameless have eight-year-old chickens. <laughs> Okay, um, how many eggs will you get from a hen? One a day. How many, how many eggs will she have over her lifetime? Chickens uh, do lay one a day. It, again, depends on day length and the weather. And she'll have, um, could have as many as a thousand eggs inside her as she's born. And she'll have all those eggs there and they just grow and develop at different rates. Um, so if you kept a chicken long enough, that's really three years approximately worth of eggs if she actually laid every egg that she has inside her body. Um, do you need a rooster for her to have those eggs? No, no rooster is needed. Uh, the hen will drop that egg down to the funiculum every day, regardless of whether there's a rooster or not. She'll just have that egg. And are brown eggs better than white eggs? Any guesses? Anybody have experience? I think they peel differently, if you've noticed that. But maybe that might be a freshness issue, and since my eggs are usually brown, I think my eggs are a little harder to peel, my hard boiled eggs, than store bought eggs. But yeah, the answer is in the diet. Chicken's diet influences for egg quality. So we have up here, some of you may have gotten to see it, and some people may not. This can't really tip it because the egg will burn out and then you won't get to see that. Come in both, these are labeled and you can see the grass-fed free-range chicken that runs around my farm and eats whatever she wants. She also gets fed some grains but you'll see how much darker her yolk is. Um, there's also interestingly a, an organic egg from Milo's eggs and his is the lightest colored yolk. Now when we're looking at egg yolks, that's probably beta carotene that we're seeing. And so uh, the more rich, more nutrient dense egg is going to be the more colorful one. It's the same reason that June is dairy month and farmers started learning to color their cheese by putting food coloring in it and making it look darker yellow. People thought it was the best cheese, the June cheese. They buy that. And, and people just naturally think, and I think it's true, that the darker color, the more nutrients are in any of our foods. Oops, I skipped a few there. Here's the chicken diet. What do they really need to eat? Just like just about every other animal, they really need three categories of things, protein, energy, and minerals. The protein they get from soybeans, insects. That is my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> My son probably called him home and said, what's for dinner, Mom? Turn your chicken. We'll ignore him right now. Um, anyway, they need the soybeans. Um, mine actually eat a lot of insects just running around. And they can get protein from pretty high quality, mostly legumes. Grasses have some protein as well. So if you're going to really do these in your backyard, you can get um, pretty good nutrition just from grasses and Clovers especially, that's a legume. Uh, for energy, they'll usually need corn or a small grain like barley, wheat, oats, something like that. They need minerals. And for our free-ranging chickens, they'll just pick that up. 
when they eat grasses or bugs or peck in the dirt. And they need, typically if they're layers, they'll need some calcium to supplement and people will often give oyster shells. We've, we've tried giving ground up oyster shells to our chickens and they totally ignore it. Just ignore it. Uh, where do you get chicken feed? If you're buying it by the bag, you can get it from Fleet Farm for about 10 bucks for a 50 pound bag. That ends up being 20 cents a pound. Uh, there's plenty of feed mills around. Uh, DePierre, Pulaski, Seymour, Greenleaf. Um, there's a website, or you can Google Wisconsin feed mills, and you can get a list of the feed mill in your community if you're not near any of those. And I know the guy in Greenleaf said recently, and we other people have said the same thing, they used to sell maybe one bag of chicken feed a week, and they've actually had to start bagging and bringing in a lot more chicken feed because so many more people are starting to raise backyard flocks. So I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, if you're buying organic feed, I put $20 for 50 pounds on there. It may not be $20 right now. I, I usually can get it from between $14 and $17 a bag, but it's going to go up to $20, so I figured I might as well just put that number up there. That's because the price of organic corn and soybeans is really, really going high. Um, that's because, well, a variety of reasons, but corn and soybeans are leaving organic systems and going into fuel, for one thing. So a lot of our acres are being diverted. And um, I know Keith Miller has, has this uh, organic feeds, Grassley Organics have it. Um, Plasky Feed Mill has an outlet right on Military Avenue at Military 9th Street, and you can get organic feeds there. Um, but even your regular co-op, if you ask them for organic chicken feed, if that's what you're really after, they will have that. A lot of them will ship it in from Cashton Feed Mill, which is down in southwest Wisconsin. Cashton's right next to where Organic Valley, the big milk co-op, does their business, and that's why Cashton has all these organic grains, makes chicken feed, and they're probably the big manufacturer of it. Um, your chickens will also get feed from the yard, the grasses and clovers. They can provide up to about a day of your chicken's diets. Um, you can also feed your chicken a lot of good vegetable scraps. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And I don't have a preference really for pelletized, cracked, or mashed versions of feed. I think all of them are okay. Sometimes you yeah, got mashed, it gets a little powdery and it kind of gums up for the chicken. I like pelleted, but I can't really get that like in there. How much feed does a chicken eat each day? Um, I think about a cup, which is about a quarter pound. And if that's if it's also scratching and around the yard and eating bugs and other things. In winter, the chickens will eat a, a bit more. And this is an outdated expression to say it's just chicken feed. Remember that saying? Younger people probably remember it. It just typically meant something was really cheap. Oh, that's just chicken feed. But not so much anymore. Because if a chicken lays one egg a day, and then she eats a nickel's worth of feed each day, then each dozen eggs just in feed alone should cost you about 60 cents. And I tend to lose track of what eggs are in the store, but right now aren't they buck fifty, two bucks a dozen? One sixty nine. One sixty nine. Thank you. Any other bids? <laughs> <laughs> and they've gone up recently too. And they went up because the price of corn went up. And that's um, also it might have something to do with that big Egg, egg lens best or the one in Iowa that had real problems because they got shown doing nasty things by some animal rights people. Um, organic eggs will be generally about double that cost, so you can expect about, about 10 to about 20 of if you're feeding a chicken organically. Organic eggs in the store are more like 350 or 4 bucks a dozen. Here's a little bit of housing. I call this one a Winnebago. <laughs> so you can build different models of backyard chicken coops. Uh, here's an A-frame. Here's something with a deluxe chicken coop. This one, if it does have wheels on those back corners, you can still lift that up and move it from place to place. This is a movable meat 
bird pen. This was sort of, um, I've been around for 20 years and watched these pens evolve over the years. This is also sometimes called the Joel Salatin model. He's a farmer in Swoop, West Virginia. I mean, just in old Virginia. He kind of perfected this model. Um, you move it and those chickens will have that grass trampled and mowed down in nothing in, in a half a day. And they also, you got to move the pen slowly forward. You can see there's wheels laying in the grass. Mm -hmm. You put the wheels on the corner and then you can roll it forward. And you got to go slowly so those chickens, especially these um, Cornish Rock Crosses, they're kind of dumb and kind of slow. And they're, <laughs> they can't walk really very well and they might get some limbs crushed if you move it too fast. Uh, there's another picture of that, where they're taking the wheels off at this point. Because you want the chickens down on the ground, they also do dumb things like get stuck under there. <laughs> Here's the pen. And these are eight-week-old, eight-pounders. Uh, most of my friends who are growing chickens in this kind of model are selling those for about $3 a pound. So that's a $24 bird, which is what we used to be for turkeys. But that's what they look like when they're they're raised on pasture. Aren't they clean and nice? Mm -hmm. And I think I, that's my preference is to eat a bird like that. Aren't they too crowded like that? Well, they have more space up toward the back. I think they're just coming forward because uh, the light's getting dim and they just want that last bit of sunlight. But no, they're not crowded in the sense that they're stressed. Okay. So I think this is fine. And remember, they started out smaller. <coughs> they're probably going to get in the next day or two, so they won't be crowded for long. This is probably a less mobile arrangement, but you can still see there's wheels, and you would pick that up with a four-wheeler and move it. And this is starting to get commercial size then for free-range pasture chicken. And this is what uh, free-range egg laying looks like, one model. And I have friends who have an actual um, hay wagon, or an old hay wagon, and they put a coop on that. And chickens go in there every night and come out every day. Um, I don't know, these guys must not. Well, actually, well, if you look back here, they have a fence. So they're keeping predators out. They have a perimeter that I'm sure is guarded because predators would get this otherwise. What kind of fencing is that? A fox or? Now, Deb has more fencing oh. that she can show, but it would be for fox and coyote. And it, there's, it's electric fencing. Oh. Um, raccoons would be good. Um, I have dogs and I have cats that protect my chickens. And you can train your animals, your own dog, to not chase chickens. Trust me, it can be done. And how is that done? <laughs> how is it done? Yeah. <laughs> um, you give them three chances, and if the dog chases the chicken the third time, guess which one hits the road? Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was kind of my puppy. But if, if you're out there, if you are out there and you yell at your dog enough, and she will kill one or two or three. So maybe it's not viable for someone with two chickens, but I, I don't <laughs> <laughs> We need some practice chickens. <laughs> so I, I guess that would be the answer is she will kill one or two before you train her and say you can't do that. And it's just like anything else you teach your dog not to do. And my cats, even with those baby chicks running around, um, I don't have a worry in the world because the mama Hen, have you ever seen mama hens go in their chicks? And my cats will not touch a chick. It's amazing. Oh, and here, Deb. Well, we don't have practice chickens at our house. We have very spoiled girls. Um, I, um, I have eight hens, and um, this one lays about as many eggs as my other ones, my <laughs> live ones. But when you come to my house, this will. Um, these are two of my girls playing on top of a slide, um, a child slide. I have it um, planted in the summer with um, grass seed and there's some succulents you can see there. And they have a really good time with it. Um, actually, when my little ones, I have two that were hatched out by a blue silky, and 
when um, they were really little and learning to fly, they would hop up on the back one and fly down, and then hop up on the next one and fly down. So it was really crazy. Um, this one here, this is Mrs. Bouquet Hyacinth. She's my only um, <laughs> full-size chicken. And this little one here is a, a white portion, that sweet pea. She's my youngest one, and they seem to be having some sort of a contact there. <laughs> Mine are totally pets, and um, I don't intend to eat any of them. Um, we got them because um, we're gardeners, and I wanted to um, use the um, bedding for, um, to add it in our compost bins, and also we have um, an orchard and we wanted them to be out there eating bugs and whatnot. But the reality of it is we also live in the country and um, with predators and other people's dogs, people walk their dogs out by us all the time and they don't have a lot of leashes and um, so I can't afford to have anybody else's dogs come running in our yard after them. Our, our own dogs are not um, very good around them either, so I do have their yard fence. Plus with gardening, um, they will scratch up a yard um, quickly and because we have people coming to our yard quite frequently to see the garden, um, we do have a fenced area that they're in, but they have a large area and I can move it around and they're great fun. Here you can see how they've um, wrecked the grass um, within their area and they're goofing off on the slide. Um, they have a, back here this is a, a sundial that I made from an old um, um, child set. And actually they hide underneath there when hawks come and in the summer they like to hang around underneath there because it's really nice and cool. There's good breezes under there. So it's mostly just for me being goofy, but they are so much fun. You don't need television if you have chickens. <laughs> and I don't know if you guys can see this back here, but see that fence? Can you see that in the back? Um, this is a fence that's um, from Premier One. It's one of your um, uh, sources in there. But it's, a, uh, it's a, an electric fence and it's plastic and you can roll it up and put it away in the winter. I don't, I just leave it out. And originally we had a solar um, module thing for it, but we found that it didn't work as well. We have too many cloudy days and you could hear it clicking, but it wasn't super powerful. So when we had the coop hardwired for um, the fact that you needed to have your water heater running, and sometimes you just want to have a light out there. So it is a hardwired fence now. Um, and so it's much more powerful. And we have never had trouble with coons or dogs, and our own dogs have learned that they all really like. This is another thing that we use for um, predators. It's a solar thing. It's actually just this little box thing here, and it blinks at night, and um, it really seems to keep um, the coyotes and owls away out where we live. You can hear coyotes howling at night. It's a terribly chilling sound, and um, it just sort of freaks you out a little bit. So I'm, I, I, we have not had trouble with any of them trying to come in there at all. And because it's solar, it doesn't cost you anything. It's I think it's like around twenty-five dollars. You guys have that copy of Backyard the Bull Tree. Mm -hmm. It's there's um, it's in there, and it's readily available in lots of places now. So it's it's probably not a bad idea um, if you're going to keep birds. Um, this is our coop, and because we're in the country, we can have a little bit bigger one, but this actually is a um, coop that is for a backyard. Um, it's a British coop. I didn't know anything about raising birds. I just went and what looked good to me, what looked cute. Um, in case, like my husband said, in case you hate doing this, it's going to have to be something that can be for a playhouse or whatever. And so this actually is a British coop. It's not French. Um, but what's wonderful about this coop, and you'll see a lot of plans now um, out there that are in the U.S. that are modeled after this company. This is a Potion Cottage Art um, from Great Britain. And what these people did was, um, this part here is actually the coop part, and all of these sides come off modularly. And then this is their run. This is wire here, but you can see this is glass. I had um, like storm windows made for it for the winter. Um, and actually, I also had on these sides, I had um, insulated sides made for it as well. I can pop these off and put the insulated sides on. 
Now, had I known how important it was to keep birds cool in the summer in Newmore when I got started, I would have built or bought an insulated coop here. Um, this coop can be moved around. There's handles on it, and you have to put two by fours and move it. It's about 600 pounds. It takes four people to move it. So we can move that around, too. Um, it's cedar. And it's held up beautifully. We've had it. I've been doing these um, this will be our fourth summer, so it's gone through three winters. And the other thing that they did, the reason they designed it this way, is underneath here, the birds can go underneath this area here and stay out of the sun and cool. Um, this is all um, bedding and um, food on the ground. My girls don't like to eat out of bowls, which these guys are telling me is wrong. They like to scratch. And um, so with this um, glass, sides and shutting this and with this insulated thing, they have a summer and all winter, it never freezes in there. So they group up all winter long and they stay healthy that way and they don't pick on each other either. Oops, um, here you can see inside, here's Maggie, she's one of my little nuts. Um, but they just go up here and at night then I have to drop down this door um, to shut them in at night. And you can buy, you know, automatic doors but I'm afraid that they would not work sometimes, so that just sort of freaks me out a little bit. The bad thing about getting chickens is everybody you know will buy you bad art. And <laughs> 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 you know, with your chickens over there, you'll see a tasteful plastic purse that somebody bought me. And <laughs> stuff like that will happen to you. Just worry. <laughs> um, this is the inside of, our, of the coop, and you can see this is the... Um, the, the watering and it's on this heated base because it, you know it does get cold in there and it can get crust. They have that fresh water every day, so you do. That's another reason why you might want electricity out there. Um, and this is just a piece of junk that I had that are. It's kind of nice um, bevel glass thing that the electricians have. To keep out of. This is the inside of the coop. This is their winter nest boxes. It's wooden and. Um, uh, you can see up here, this is the edge of the cedar heater. That's in your um, materials, and you'll see that in the backyard culture thing. That is actually a heater for dogs, puppies, dog kettles, and it doesn't get too hot. And if I have it on a thermostat. I got it set at 32 degrees so that they don't um, get too cold. Because I have banties and I have really fancy breeds, and some of them are just too light bodied for real, real cold. And I have one of those thermostats that I can look at my kitchen window and see how cold it is out in the food. Because I just don't want it to be too cold or too hot. I mean, it's too hot is worse than too cold, really. Um, and then you can see down here all these pine shavings. That's what I use. It's really nice. It's clean. It doesn't pack down like piece <coughs> of paper. Um, and it's really easy to keep clean. Then um, what the side is off, and you can see this is their, their roost that they go up on. And actually, my little mantis, they mostly just hang together. Only my big Orpington hyacinth likes to really go up on there. And I did have to put chicken wire underneath it because um, one time one of them slipped underneath there. I don't know how she got underneath there, and I couldn't find her, and here she was stuck under there. So just something else to consider if you have the little birds. And this is just um, showing you that they eat spinach, and here they've got, um, they get buttermilk and oatmeal out of the dish, with, and I give them those um, dried mealworms that bluebirds like. They love those. They will do almost anything for you if you will do that, feed them those. But um, I don't get very many eggs, and it's because they're probably too fat and too spoiled. But they're so cute. So <laughs> and she has big goofy feet. You can see the goofy feet on uh, sweet pea back there. And this flash so she's got blue ears. I mean, how cute is that? <laughs> and here Santa came last year. This is just, oh, you can see how, how this stays, you know, it just stays um, soft. And so they can play and scratch. Because otherwise, they don't pick on each other. They're too crowded or stressed. That's, it's, it's just like junior high. Totally. And who this is another one of my chickens. Excuse that, me, who babysits your chickens when you go away? Well, when you go away for the weekend, you can put on enough food and you have that automatic water and shut the door. You know, it, you can go for a weekend. Otherwise, I live in Hobart and I have a farmer across the road. 
and his kids babysit my chickens because he always butchers his chickens. So we don't let Uncle Marvin babysit. <laughs> <laughs> and they're wonderful. They know more about chickens than me. I'm sure they get, you know, laugh about my chickens all the time. So anyway, I love them. And if you guys want to get pets, it's great, great fun. Um, but it is kind of addictive. And I, I encourage you to try it because you learn by doing it. I'm actually going to take Belle's chicken class to learn everything I'm doing wrong. But I've been having fun for four years. And my girls are old. I, mean, I have eight, and three of them are at least um, seven years old. And then I have um, two that are three or four, and my youngest ones are a year old. And in the summer, I might get one or two eggs a day, maybe. I mean, in the winter, I don't. But they're just fun, and I can't imagine not having them now. They're just goofy. Well, with the wood shavings, in the winter, once a week, do you shovel them out and replace them? No, I don't do it once a week. You, I mean, chickens, people think are really smelly, they're really not. I mean, it, I probably only clean that coop out maybe every three weeks. I mean, you once it doesn't smell like wood shavings mm -hmm. and chickens, it's really easy to clean out. You take those sides off, and I just scrape it out with a, um, I have a, a pole thing, and then it goes right into the compost bin. And then it sits for a year and a half to two years before it gets mm -hmm. used in the garden. It couldn't be simpler, and then just put some more pine shavings on it, and it smells like pine. I mean, it's really, um, the, this coop was really very well thought out. But like I said, there's a lot of American coop designs, and I know some people in this room have come to see the coop and are going to build one that has been in like Country Living Magazine, um, that are very similar to this now. So people are copying this idea because in Great Britain, a lot of people have chickens in the back. So it's, it's designed to get the area where they're scratching around. You can literally just pull those walls. You can take all that off. Oh. Yeah, and you can actually move that whole poop. But it is about okay. 600 pounds. Okay. 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 Well, so uh, now something completely different. My chickens are less than camper. <laughs> um, so I think um, I'm the novice. My name's Abby Malcolm. Um, I've got two beautiful ladies uh, living in my backyard in uh, Asher East River. So mine are truly urban chickens, and I do have the first um, Green Bay City chicken permit. So which leads me to we've got the ordinance handout. I hope you all grabbed it. Otherwise, there are plenty of copies in the back. Um, but I've got my eggs from my two lovely ladies um, and the coop that I built out of uh, some found materials and then just one of my girls and I think that's pretty. Oh. All right. Um, so the ordinance first, the white single page front and back. Um, I copied the exact ordinance that was passed on the 17th of May um, that Jim Schmidt, our lovely mayor, signed into law. So you've got the whole deal, but just kind of the bullet points are it's $5 annually for up to four hens, no boys allowed. Um, you can pay that at the city clerk's office. Hopefully they've got it down pat a little bit more than when I went in and got the first one. They were a little befuddled on what I was there for. <laughs> So I was very excited and they were not. <laughs> she had to do some digging and I was like, okay. Is it a Green Bay ordinance or Brown County ordinance? Um, it's the city of Green Bay. It is. Yep. So you'll have to check out what your city ordinance says because it is a city ordinance. So, um, yep. Uh, so some bullet points from this uh, ordinance are the hens must be a minimum of 25 feet from your neighbor's homes. So I just uh, marked it off, figuring that my feet were about a foot. So I stomped it off uh, to the middle of my backyard. And then hens must be kept in a backyard. They must be kept in a pen that is just used for chickens. So our backyard is completely fenced. Um, we have a puppy as well, but uh, we have to have a separate chicken pen to make sure that your chickens don't get loose, because that is from the And the animal control lady, at least in the city of Green Bay, hates chickens. <laughs> she's, she's chased them around one too many times and they run. So you can understand that it just doesn't make her job much easier. So um, you need a pen. Um, yeah, and no slaughtering within the city limits. So we've got some information on where you can take your chickens to be 
pretty humanely slaughtered. Um, but no doing that at home. <laughs> so here's me very proudly with the chickens that I, uh, I built myself. This is their warm weather house.
um, or are you on a bigger scale looking to sell eggs? When you look at bantams and large hull, there's two different types of or sizes of chickens. Uh, the bantam is on the left side, and the large hull is on the uh, other side, right. <laughs> <laughs> so the bantam on the left and large hull on the right. Bantams are weighed in ounces, and bantams are a quarter the size of a uh, large hull birds as a general rule. Bantams eat less, they lay smaller eggs, but they make great pets. Large hull run generally about 4 pounds to 13 pounds, depending on the breed, and they're going to lay a larger egg, and they're, the bantams are bred more for uh, the ornamental aspect, where the large hull are bred more for production. Um, when it comes to the size of the eggs, the bantam's eggs are smaller, and I have, there is a sample of a bantam egg up here, broken open. As a general rule, two bantam eggs equal three large bubble eggs. Is no, other way around. Three bantam eggs equal two large bubble eggs. So, and that's usually what I tell people when you're looking at recipes for bacon and stuff. That's what you want to convert them with. Um, if you look at the egg up here that's cracked open from the bantam, you can get a general feel for the size comparison uh, when looking at the, the full size. When you look at breed purposes, there's really four different categories. You're looking at egg breeds. Um, your egg breeds are going to be your best layers as a general rule. They're going to lay large white eggs. Uh, they hardly ever go broody. And going broody is meaning they're sitting on a nest trying to hatch chicks. Um, egg breeds are notorious for not ever catching chicks out. Um, but they do tend to be flightier on the wild side. Your dual purpose breeds are your brown egg laying breeds for the most part. They tend to lay less eggs, um, but they tend to be a lot calmer. They make a lot better pets. And they do go broody sometimes. Depending on the breed, some will only do it in the spring, some do it throughout the year. Uh, you have hybrids, which are, are produced only for their meat or egg qualities. And your hybrid, if you're looking at breeding them, you will, they will never be breed true. Um, and you'll never be able to show them. Specialty breeds are your ornamental and fancy breeds. And then I yeah, threw in with that the egg color breeds, because there's a few breeds that'll lay uh, the green eggs, chocolate eggs, and pink eggs, which I'll get more to in a bit. Pure egg breeds, a little bit of history on them. Most of them come from the Mediterranean. The vast majority of them actually come from Italy, for whatever reason. Um, they have large combs and they lay large white eggs. Those large combs are sensitive to freezing weather and they're going to freeze fast. A chicken with a frozen comb usually stops laying eggs and may never start laying eggs if it's a severe frozen comb. Um, they're not likely to sit on their eggs and try to hatch them. And the most common breeds that you're going to probably run into are the Leghorns, which are the number one egg producing breed in the world. Hamburgs. Hamburgs are a Dutch breed and they're known as the everyday layer. And Konas are a great free range bird. And the Norcas, I threw in there because they're actually the largest Mediterranean breed and they lay the largest white eggs. When it comes to the breeds, I threw in some pictures. Um, this is a silver spangled hamburg, a golden spangled hamburg, uh, the modal dancona, a white leghorn, and the black menorca. Um, when it comes to colors of birds, really, I have a book over here, The Standards of Perfection, that shows the majority of the colors that are available, but the colors that are available are really limited only by your imagination. You're going to be able to find a color out there that if, if you're looking purely for color, you're going to be able to call, find a color that you like. Your dual purpose breeds, they lay the brown eggs. Um, the vast majority of them were created in the United States, and there's one Canadian <coughs> creation. Most of them are going to try to hatch their eggs, most of them in the spring. You, the majority of them won't, won't do it year round. The most common breeds are the Plymouth Rocks and the Rhode Island Reds. 
and those, the Rhode Island Reds are really dark red, and the Plymouth Rocks are what a lot of people think of when they think of, or those two breeds, are what they think of that your grandparents kept. Those are what most people are referring to. Um, the Wyandots have the small comb or smaller combs. The smaller that comb is, the less likely or less sensitive they are to frost. And that's one thing in this area to keep in consideration is uh, how you're going to keep your birds housing wise in relation to the cold weather. Buckeyes have tiny combs along with the Chanticleers. Chanticleers were created in Canada and they were created or selected specifically for cold weather laying and they will lay through the winter with, they say, with no heat at all. But they're not sensitive to, the, to their combs and wattles freezing, so that's why. Then I put through in some pictures, silver laced wine dot, a barred Plymouth rock, uh, the white Chanticleer, and then these are, uh, this is the Buckeye, the New Hampshire, and the Rhode Island Red. Quick question. Mm -hmm. How important is it to actually provide heat for these birds versus just provide windbreaks for them so the wind is out of an arm climate? It really depends on your breed. Um, chickens, as a general rule, are most comfortable between 35 degrees and 70 degrees. So if you can keep them in that temperature range, they should be fine. Um, chickens throw off a lot of heat. And if you can get them in a small enough space, there is a potential that they can heat their own chicken coop. You know, if you have five birds in a small enough space, they'll heat it. Um, they can survive below freezing temperatures for a while. Um, I wouldn't say a long time. Once you really fall below like 25, 27 degrees, they're going to start freezing cones and freezing tolls and stuff like that. So for the most part, you're not going to, a windbreak isn't going to be enough for the most part. Your hybrids. I do not. I have no problem with hybrids. I do not encourage them though, because they are bred for only one purpose, and that's for production. Um, I've seen a lot of situations with hybrids. They don't make good pets. They're not friendly birds. Uh, not that the other ones are, but they tend to be a little friendlier. These hybrids were created strictly for production. Um, their main purpose is to produce an egg or to pr produce meat. 90% of the birds that are hybrids are um, sex-linked, which what that means is when they're chicks, the hatchery can go through and decide, is this a male or a female, when you're ordering them. They don't have to do anything special. They look at the color of the chick, and they know it's a male or a female. Cornish cross are the birds you buy at the grocery store. Um, and somebody asked a question about, Val showed the picture of the Cornish cross in the, uh, the Salatin unit and asked if they were too crowded. The thing with the Cornish cross, they appear to be crowded, but those little buggers don't hardly move. They move from their food to the water and back to the food and back to the water. And that's, that's where I say they're bred for production in mind. That's what they were bred to do. Um, when I was living up north a couple years ago, a retired farmer from this area had lived up there. He was raising in the summer of these chickens that got real big and I think that must have been what he had. He said he had trouble getting them out of the, he had them in yep. his garage, out of the garage and he couldn't believe it and, and their hearts didn't grow fast yep. enough, they'd fall over dead. I would, that was the next thing I was going to say with those production birds. They're not good pet birds either because usually, I, I, I had a few of them that I bought as a pet when I was younger. A lot of times, by the time they're six to eight, or not even eight months, usually by the time they're six months old, they're having heart attacks because they grew so fast. They just, their, their body can't keep up. The legs broke? Yeah, mm -hmm. they get bad legs and stuff. The only purpose for those meats, those corned cross, is for meat. If you're going to raise something for meat, that's what I think. Um, none of the hybrids, again, are going to breed true. And the other thing that I like to discourage people from getting hybrids is because a lot of people don't realize this, but when you're buying just the females, and that's where people are buying these production birds for because they want the eggs, all of those young males are destroyed as soon as they hatch. So that's why they're colored the way they are. Now, that's a bad, I mean, we got ourselves in this situation by wanting cheap food is what it really comes down to. 
uh, we have, I don't remember, gold sex link, a red sex link, and a black sex link. And how these work, these two gold, gold and red, the chick, uh, the white chicks are going to be the female, is that what you said, Adele? And the red ones are going to be the males. So what happens is the, the breeder goes through and all these male chicks go in a different vat, or a different bin, so they can sell them as the male chicks, and then the females in the other one. With the black sex link, uh, it's a little bit harder. The females are on, are this group, the males are this group, and the only way to tell is by that little white dot on their head, or on their forehead. That tells me that they're the male. The other way they do it, and there's actually a lot of breeds that you can do it with, um, they look under the wing when the chick is, it has to be newly hatched within that first day or two. You can look under the wing, and the males will have little tiny wing feathers, and the females will have none. So they do it that way as well on some of them. If you have your ornamental breeds, these are going to be more of your pets. Um, their only purpose really is for decoration or to be pretty around the yard. Um, they range from good layers to bad layers. And as a general rule, if the large fall variety is a good layer, the bantam is going to be a good layer too. Um, but there are exceptions. I've had some breeds that only lay 20 eggs a year in the, in the bantam. So uh, these guys are going to make great pets. It's where most of the bantams go. Their care is no different than any other bird. They you take care of them the same way. Um, and then the most common, or the ones that catch the most attention, usually are your silkies, your Polish, and your Colchins. Um, this is a Polish. This is a, now there's two different types of Polish here. The, the, this one is what we call a normal feather Polish, which she's got the smooth feathers. The one next to her is a frizzled Polish, and they look like they, if, the only way to describe it really is to imagine if they walk through the, a windstorm backwards, that's what it looks like the feathers are doing is curling backwards. How can they see? Uh, the Polish actually, people ask that a lot. The Polish can see very well. Oh, wrong button. That, that spot on their head, if you would hold them up, they, you can see the eyes looking right back at you. It just appears to us like they can't see. Um, I will say though that some of the, when you get into more exhibition, like what I do when I do the judging, there are Polish that cannot see. And personally it's pointless, but some people want that big puff that as big as they can get it. But, but what about the animal? I know, that's why I don't like it. <laughs> um, Next, to it, the, a lot of these are roosters because it's hard to find female pictures. But this is a kubalea. They have, they're known for their long tails. The females will also have a long tail. Um, these are little deanders. These two are some of the smallest, or two of the smallest bantam breeds. They're going to be about 16 ounces. Holy girl. Yeah. And they actually, this is the breed, breed that I keep, and bantam egg I have is from one of those hens. This is a silky. A lot of people say they look like a rabbit crossed with a chicken. They, have fur. Um, they really don't have fur. It, it is feathers, but their feathers don't stick together. Uh, a little sea bright, uh, Phoenix or Yokohama rooster. These guys grow really long tails. Um, I will warn you though, and this is the reason I put these in here. Um, I used to breed these and I had roosters with eight foot tails. You probably, in a, as a general rule, are not going to find that anywhere. You're going to have to go to a specialty breeder to get somebody that gets a tail that long. How did you keep the tail clean as it grew? It always stayed clean. They were on grass. Mm -hmm. He was on grass, and he just dragged it around in the glass, grass, and it was clean all the time. Did they roost up high or yep. something? Okay. Yep. Um, the middle one, that's a modern game. Um, we talked about it before the before we started the class. These guys were pre, um, back in England, they were created when cockfighting was legal. And these little fellers were bred to be the best, one, supposedly the best fighting birds. Now that that's been outlawed, um, they're more of a show bird now. But they're supposed to, if you notice, he stands up on his tiptoes. That is something you want in the breed. Tiptoes all the way up as tall as it can be. And then the last one is a little cochin. Um, she has feathers on her feet. 
And whether they have feathers on their feet or not, it's a breed characteristic. It does not affect their care or anything like that. Finally, we have the Easter egg chickens. Um, they're not actually a true breed. They're actually a hybrid. They come in a lot of different colors and patterns. Um, and their egg colors, egg, eggs vary in color from a pale brown through pink, green, and blue. Uh, when they're talking about that pink, though, a lot of people think pink, I want a pink egg. It's really not. It's a really pale, odd colored brown is the best way <coughs> to describe it. And they call it a pink egg. And I want to touch on disease prevention. And the biggest thing with disease prevention, I like to cover this so that people are aware of what's out there. However, it's just like people, it's just like your dog, it's just like your cat. These diseases are not running around. Don't let this scare you on keeping birds. Um, it's just like you going to the doctor, if you get a cold, it happens. Um, they're not, I can count on my one hand in 20 years how many bad disease situations I've had, and I won't even call them bad because they, I fixed them, them, all of them. I don't think I had, I lost really any. Um, the best way to prevent disease, though, is to use proper housing. Your birds need to be out of the drafts, out of extreme weathers, and out of damp conditions. If you keep them out of those conditions, there you shouldn't have any problems at all with diseases. Um, always supply clean food and fresh water. Keep your chicken coop clean, because the cleaner it is, the less likely you are to have problems. I tell people, watch your birds closely. You should spend at least once a week, um, for lack of better words, intimately with your birds, looking at what do their droppings look like? What do their eyes look like? What do they sound like? How are they acting? And that isn't a quick, oh, they look good. That's a good at least 10 minute, five, 10 minute observation of how are they looking. And I like to, when I listen to breathing, I like, prefer, that they can't see me because they sometimes tend to modify their breathing when somebody's around just because it's oh, something's different and, and whatever it may be. The other thing I believe really firmly in is using apple cider vinegar. It's people come to me and say, I have a sick bird, what do I do? And the first thing I say is, did you give it apple cider vinegar? No, try it. It's the best thing. It cures or fixes so many things fairly quick. How you use it is you give it to them in their water. It's about, and I, I really don't know because I don't measure it, I just know how much it goes in. I'm guessing it's about maybe three quarters of a cup to a cup of apple cider vinegar per gallon of water. Um, if you don't want to drink it, they're not going to want to drink it. So that's the easiest way to tell is if you try it and you can taste it, it's too much. You're also going to want to start them out light with it because they can taste a little better than us and if they taste something different in their water, they may not drink it as well. But, and then you're just building up slowly to the, you know, an amount that you think is appropriate, you know, that three quarters cup to a cup range and then watch them. If they stop drinking, then you need to cut it back a little bit and then, then go at that rate. Is coccidiosis a pretty, is yep. that still pretty prevalent? Yep, I'm going to cover that in the next yeah. slide. <coughs> so you put the vinegar in all the time? I, I would say 80% of the time I do. Yeah. And I find it's easier to, as a prevention than a cure. Um, and then I always tell people isolate your sick birds. The reason you isolate is to stop what they have from moving to your other birds, if at all possible. Now, a lot of you are probably only going to have a couple birds. By the time you find a sick bird, it's probably already exposed the other ones and, has, and hasn't infected. But I still would like to encourage people to isolate those sick birds just so you can keep a closer eye on them. The most common diseases, and again, don't panic. This is not like end of the world. Um, the problem with diseases with poultry, I can't teach you all of them because number one, they all mimic each other, or the vast majority of them mimic each other, and it's really a long class to figure out what they are, or a lot of experience. The most common you're gonna see, your colds. Uh, colds are 
really coughing and sneezing. When you hear it, you're going to know. You're going to be like, oh, they're coughing or they're sneezing. That's what, exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's easiest to treat it and prevent it with apple cider vinegar. I've never had a bird get a cold or a, a sneeze that wasn't cured by apple cider vinegar. Um, the next bullet, the safest treatment or the most logical, and I'm talking large scale now, is to put those birds down because it's an unhealthy bird. And you never are able to return that bird back to the condition it was in before it got sick. You know, they may never lay again, they may never fully physically recover, whatever it may be. Pilorum is the number one disease that you have to be concerned with. If you walk away anything from this class on diseases, it's pilorum. Pilorum is transmitted from the mother to the chick via the egg, or the egg contents. It is extremely deadly to the chicks. Um, we're talking like 90% of the chicks will die if they have pilorum. How do you know? What does that look like? What is pilorum? What does the disease look like in the chick? Or it, the you'll, it doesn't. Oh. You won't know. It. Um, the only thing you'll know is you walk out to your pen and there's dead chicks. That's going to be your sign. Um, but the easiest way around this the United States has a program that's called NPIP, or National Poultry Improvement Plan, which requires that the flock be chlorine free. If you are buying chicks from anybody, ask them if they are chlorine free. If they, if they are chlorine free, I will guarantee you they will say, yes I am, here's my certificate number, I can get you the certificate, what do you want? Um, if you look at, like if you look at Murray McMurray or Ideal Poultry or some of the more common hatcheries, they will put it right on the front of their catalog, alarm free, NPIP number, whatever it is. If the person that you ask at all hesitates, they're probably not alarm free. And that doesn't mean that they have the disease, but I would steer away from them for that reason. If you're not actually breeding chicks, Yep, you is still it, want chlorine free because it can be uh, deadly to adults as well. It's less deadly to adults, but it still can kill the adults. Adult chickens, not people. Correct. It is not people. Correct. Correct. Wow. Um, say that again. On these various diseases, so you're talking about the birds, but what about the coop itself? Are there implications of how well something has to be in the discovery? Um, the disease the air is doing yeah, pilorum, it's hen to chick. There is nothing in the coop. There will be nothing there. Um, the other disease, coxidiosis, you're not going to get rid of because it's, it's everywhere. You know, it can be in the ground forever. This is not, this is diarrhea is what it is. And you can get around it by using a coxidiostat in your feed. And that will take care of the whole thing. And then you don't have to worry about it. The problem with this is that the chicks get it and they get dehydrated and then they can die from it. So, but otherwise, disease wise, um, there's nothing a little bit of bleach can't fix. Um, actually, I should say that too. Bleach is good. The number one disinfectant, the sun. Get the sun on it, get it cleaned out, get the sun on it, and it's a great disinfectant. So. Mm -hmm. Does that only affect chicks? Paxidiosis. Mm -hmm. um, they can all get it, but it's, it's minor in the adults. It's worse than the chicks. But like I said, these, this is the, these two are what you're going to run into the most often. Are there any kind of chicken diseases that people could get for being around chicken and breeding chickens? And um, chickens, now yeah, might be better to speak at this. But chickens have, you can get salmonella from like the eggs and the meat and stuff. You cannot get salmonella from the chicken itself. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't, I always tell people, I don't know of any diseases that are directly, you know, taking for care of chickens, oh my gosh, I'm going to get this disease or anything like that. Um, I had a problem, I'm allergic to birds. That was my biggest problem medically with my birds is that the dander and stuff I'm allergic to, so I have to be careful of that. You don't want to keep dirty birds. You know, if you're handling dirty birds, there's that fecal matter, all of that. But there, I can't think of anything that
that's really jumping out at me that's saying, you're, you're, you have to be careful of this. But I always say, wash your hands after you handle your birds. Because you just don't want to take that chance. And avian influenza, if that's what you're wondering about, we can talk about that separately because I have different beliefs on the whole avian influenza thing. Talk about that one on one. But I do not, I personally, Jeremy Charles saying this, do not believe you're going to catch avian influenza from your birds. Yep. Um, you mentioned flora was transferred by the egg, yep. um, and we wouldn't know that the, the chicks were infected with that. Is there um, any side effects for people as you eat nope. the eggs? No. Nope. No. Nope. But the other thing is you're probably not going to eat those eggs because 95% of those chicks are going to die. So it's, it's very remote. Um, this has not came up. When this, this came up like two years ago as a... It's as an a, isolated plot. Yeah. It's not, I wouldn't hardly worry about no. it. No. <laughs> Just be aware of it. Um, yeah, it was an isolated plot. And then before that, it was like the 1940s that they had issues with it. So. Common parasites. These you're going to run into more than the diseases. Um, lice. The first thing I have to say, they are not the same as human lice. You are not going to get lice from your chickens. They get it from birds outside, from the sparrows, from whatever. Um, their lice, poultry lice, are water soluble. So good old Duncan water with some shampoo. Uh, Bait Johnson's, I recommend Johnson's Johnson's Bait Shampoo. Dissolves the lice right away. Um, I will say that they are gross when they crawl on you, but they only live on you for about 20 minutes and then they're dead. I have. I treated myself for lice one time because I didn't realize it was. <laughs> do they bite you? What is that? Do they no. bite you when you try to put them in water? No. Oh, they don't. Um, I because I show before we show birds, we give them a bath always before we show, and I have birds that the first time it's a little panicky for them. Just like if you wash your dog or whatever. Um, the second time, by the second and third time, I, we laugh because I can put the bird in the water and they just relax and are like, oh, here it comes. And you get out the hair dryer and they'll lay on the, you know, wherever I'm washing them. I have silkies that will lay and they'll lift their wing up. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really, guys? <laughs> so, yeah, the bath is a little traumatic maybe the first time, but. After that, it's nothing. Um, the other thing that I swear by is Adam's flea and tick. It will take care of any external parasite that you have. If you don't want to use Adam's flea and tick, you can always use Seven Garden Dust. And if you don't want to use either one of those, letting them roll around in good old dry dirt helps as well. Taking a dust bath. Mites are a little harder to get rid of than lice. Um, it's definitely way easier to prevent than to treat. Um, the best way to prevent it is keep your coops clean, and then if they get it, treat them with Adam's flea and tick or seven. The garden dust is probably not going to get, or ground dust is probably not going to get rid of those. If you get either one of these, you're probably going to have to clean your coop a little bit. Um, lice, it's really just cleaning out what's in there and disposing of it. Mites, you're going to have to use uh, Adam's flea and tick around the entire coop, or inside the entire coop because they're, the mites are going to crawl off and into the cracks and crevices where the lice are going to stay mostly on the birds. And then the last thing is worms. Just like any other animal, chickens can get worms. Um, like I said, the best treatment I still swear by is the apple cider vinegar and the water. Um, you can, some people worm them uh, twice a year. I don't recommend that because I don't know what it comes through the bird and the eggs. So, and that's another reason I stay with that apple cider vinegar because I know that I can drink apple cider vinegar, although it may not taste good, it's not harmful to me. Are you giving your chickens the apple cider vinegar like just a couple times a year, whether it's I would, you're noticing anything? I give it to them, I usually keep a gallon in the refrigerator and I give it to them probably eight months out of the year if they're giving it, because I use it more for prevention than anything. And that's daily for eight months? Yeah. I'm not for eight, I just, it may be like today, I just, they asked me before, I'm like, oh, you know what, I haven't given them any since last week, but 
once a week or something. Yeah. But I. With the diseases, with these chickens, do they have to go to like a vet, like a dog, or a cat, you or a can take them to the vet, yes. Is there a vet for chickens? You have to find a vet that knows about poultry, and there is a vet in Green Bay. I don't know what his or her name is. We'll, we'll put the, um, we have some contact information at the end. And then if you have to put a chicken down, like, if you're going to just raise them as pets, the vet would take care of it. I couldn't think of it. Uh, the vet probably could take care of it in jail. You talk about that too. So you dispose of them, you can't just bury them in your backyard. No. Oh, um, you, you could. could. You probably could. You can't slaughter them, but you can bury them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. trying to get their kids involved in this as well. I love that idea. Um, but the hard thing for a lot of people to realize is kids will be kids, and if you force them into this project or into a, a hobby, they're not going to want anything to do with it. You really got to look for the kids and let them kind of develop it on their own. Um, the best way I find to do that is if they're showing an interest in the birds, you know, kind of get them out there, get them handling the birds, doing whatever. Um, take them, to sh or excuse me, let them pick, if you're going to let them get birds, let them pick the birds they want to get. If you tell them you have to get this, you just sent that whole thing out the window for them. Because it's not, they're probably not going to want that anyways, but simply because you picked it. But. <laughs> um, take them to shows to learn about breeds. Um, and I say take them to the shows because that's where you're going to see the most different kinds of birds. Uh, people don't realize this, but there are what I call seven shows in Wisconsin every year. Um, there's shows in Fond du Lac, Beaver Dam, Portage. There's one which, like 10 minutes across the border into Illinois. There's one on the west side of Wisconsin. There's one in um, Richland Center, and there's one just in Upper UP. Every year those shows take place. So they're around. Um, buy chicks and let them raise them, with the, or let the kids raise them. That's the biggest thing is don't get the kids adult birds because they're going to be a little more jumpy. The, bird, the adults are going to be a little more jumpy than what the kids really want. Um, or when they can have those chicks, those little, I don't know, six ounce chicks are a lot less threatening to, than a large bird. Um, and plus, when they get them as chicks, if they handle them all the time, those birds will be extremely tame. Um, help them learn how to take care of their birds. Understand that their interests are going to change a lot. Um, I see that a lot with the 4-H kids. They go from one thing to another faster than faster than I do. <laughs> um, and go with the flow and never discourage them. And the one thing, if you cannot keep chickens right now in the city and you really want to do this, and your kids are in a youth program, there are cities locally that will make an exception for a youth project. So if you have a kid in, in that's interested in a youth program, check with your city. They may make that, that exception because it's a youth project. Um, different things that you can do with the kids. Exhibit at a local county fair. Take a trip to a station show. Visit a breeder. Uh, choose two breeds and have them compare them. Exhibit at a station show. Join a club. Um, help them teach others about, about their birds. Kids love to show their knowledge, usually. Um, and the best way that I find that kids can do that is go to a nursing home with your birds. Get, check with the nursing home first. Visit a daycare or take your birds to school and then learn about the breeds that they're keeping as well. Yep. Back to you. Oh, question first. Yep. Okay, so you let the food and then order chicks. Yep. How old are the chicks when you get them? Um, when you're ordering them through the mail, yeah. they're probably, the, if you get them on Monday, they're probably hatched on Sunday. Okay. So they're between a day and a day and a half old. Now, do they go immediately in the coop, or do you got to keep them isolated for like over here? You're going to want to keep them heated at 95 degrees for the first week. And then every week after that, you drop it to five degrees until it's about 70 degrees. <coughs> and it doesn't, they cannot go in with the adult birds. But they can't, you can raise them wherever you can keep it 95 degrees. So 
So that's an improvement. We can um, maybe defer to the rest of the questions a little bit to the very end because we're running out of time a little bit. So we'll just finish this up and then all four of us will get up here and you can ask questions of any of us at that point. Is that okay with that? We'll just finish this up. This is um, the angel of death. This is um, Denise. And for, for, it's a little bit sensitive for those of you who have pet chickens, so I don't want to do this too lovely. <coughs> Um, this is her shop, and uh, her niece and her husband have to put up this little building, and it's a uh, state certified chicken processing facility. It's one of the very, very few in the state that have been licensed um, any time in the last 30 years. Chicken processing places have been one on business right and left. This is one of the very few, and we're kind of lucky to have her. Uh, this is uh, the inside. Uh, I'm not going to actually show you any chicken slaughter at this point. But basically, uh, you hang a chicken upside down, the blood flows to its head, it falls asleep, and there's just a quick stroke across its throat, and it bleeds to death. And it usually doesn't flop or flip out or anything like that. Um, it's, it's relatively, I would imagine, painless. The chicken is basically going to sleep. And then there's a vat back here with uh, water that's kept just below boiling, well, maybe not quite that hot. The birds are dipped in it for a certain length of time. That loosens up the feathers from the skin. And they, they're thrown in this plucker. These are rubber fingers. And they tumble in there, usually about four birds at a time. And the feathers are completely off the bird in about a minute or so. Uh, from there, the birds are, are hung up here, and they're eviscerated. And if you've ever butchered a bird or eviscerated one, the guts, um, it's not messy at all. Um, nature has a really neat way of containing everything in, in a, almost an envelope. And that whole envelope just comes right outside the bird, drops into that hole in the table, and there's really not even blood um, at that point. There's just a gut pile that comes out, and there's your bird, and feet are cut off, head is cut off, and then uh, Denise will bag the birds, and if you're doing something like a farmer's market, she'll weigh them, and that's a certified scale that she has, and then people will be able to sell their birds at a farmer's market, and it's all stainless steel. She has to be, you know, sanitary, clean up, everything. Uh, here's her phone number, and that's in your packet. If you uh, didn't get a packet, you might want to write that down. And uh, they're located north of Jillick, so that's about 40 miles drive from here. And she'll take as many as, um, or as few as two birds. And if you call her ahead of time and you would just say, I'm coming at 10 o'clock, bring your birds in a cardboard box, and she would um, dispatch them right there for you. If you don't want your birds back, she would probably take them and just keep them for you. Um, maybe make a donation. But it, it would take her, if she knows when you're coming and she's ready to go, it'll take her five or ten minutes to dispatch a couple of birds. I, I brought 20 birds up to her and she had them done in an hour. You can help her if you want. Um, here we're going to start over and do some resources. I'm teaching a poultry class. Um, I teach some <coughs> other classes as well if anyone's interested in just in general. The classes, I have handouts up here, but I didn't think everyone would be interested. Um, one that's coming up that might be of interest to people, though, because it also involves an ordinance, is backyard agriculture and landscapes, um, permaculture. It's, it's chickens and then all the landscaping that goes with it. So if you're interested in that, come on up and you can get that later. Um, other resources? Um, so, so we'll, why don't you come on up and then we'll be able to answer questions. And these are all in the back of your handout. So these are just some books that I picked up uh, knowing nothing about chicken keeping and not having scholars or anything to help me out. It's a couple of good guides for you. They're all on your printed slide. So. Um, and these are my resources. Uh, of course, I'm a little partial to 4-H because I threw those in there. Um, any of those organizations should be able to get you information at least to help you get started on keeping birds or other venture. And these are 
some websites that we found. Um, yeah, these are some yeah. of yours that you're right. 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 Um, My Pet Chicken is one where um, that's geared to people that want backyard chickens, one or two chickens, and it's pretty helpful. Um, the Premier One supplies that's the one with the um, fencing and that sweeter heater. Um, that's in that backyard poultry. Backyard poultry, she did them a plug. Great magazine because it's written for people that really don't know very much, and it's really nice because there's and the ads in there um, are very very helpful. I guess the best thing is just to dive in really. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet. Too. There's lots of I don't know what they call them blogs or ads or whatever. Um, you know that you can go to too that are helpful. And I would say mostly I wouldn't be afraid of chickens. I mean, no chickens. Chickens. It's really hard to go wrong with them. They're so easy. Once you try them, uh, it's so hard. I've done this all along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do we have time for questions? Is it, is it the camp of guarding your hamstrings? Actually, the um, NWTC has, um, is clearing garden space on the other side of the town here. We're going to have organic gardens, and yes, we will have chickens. There are more resources over there too. Uh, books that I brought that are I found helpful. Um, there are some books over there that you're welcome to look at as well. Um, I'm just wondering when you apply a clear license for chickens, yep. do they just give it to you or do they kind of inspect your house? And no, stuff like no, they just give it to you. It's like a two-year box form. City Clark, so it's five dollars. Yeah, you have to know your personal number, but I can they looked it up for you because they're the city clerk. So it's very painless. <laughs> chickens are in there with one of them and everybody was picking on you. It's just about ball of feathers. Yeah, there's Why a pecking order. It's a, it's a pecking order. They're a, it, it really is. They're, they're a, a group animal and there's always got to be somebody at the top and somebody at the bottom. That's very that's true. It's, it's difficult to watch. When you bring in, if you bring in like pullets, um, a little bit older birds, I got my two littlest ones were about eight. Yeah, eight, eight <coughs> And um, you have to keep them in a separate cage inside of the group, inside of your fenced area, so everybody can see everybody else. For I did it for um, oh probably almost two, oh, two weeks, and uh, little by little. And when you still let them out, there still is an adjustment phase. It's really really hard to watch, but they figure it out. And I mean, if there was if it was excessive or they were drawing blood or whatever, I would separate that bird again. Then that's probably an issue where they're maybe too crowded, too stressed, whatever. Which is why it's really nice to give them as much space as you can and things to do. Like it sounds silly, but if you buy head lettuce or whatever, let them roll that around and play with it. Or why I like to have dirt and and things for them to goof off with because they they're like 
they get bored and then they pick on each other. I mean, it's really very interesting. Red lights will also help with pecking feathers. Say, uh, I know badly eat a lot of ticks. Do chickens eat ticks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We use our chickens on our farm. The question is, do they eat ticks? We use chickens on our organic farm as a fly control method. So they're free ranging enough that they actually go through the cow patties and eat anything they find in there. And they, uh, but they'll eat um, flies. They'll snatch them mm -hmm. right off the hair. Mm -hmm. I have a breed that's not supposed to go broody, but they do. So I'll help.